I'm going to switch scenes to the harp. And we'll spend a little time with Lori Riley's The Ash Grove. So Kelly. Thank you. 
Let me take care of my fur baby and I'll be right back. Kim, it's about a three-minute warning. Oh, okay, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to let you know, uh, um, it's about three minutes. All right, Dave. Um, I'll try, uh, try something new here. And that was the butterfly. One of my favorite nebulas is the butterfly nebula. So I thought it would play the butterfly. And I hope you all have a happy St. Patrick's Day coming up. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. As always, that was really great. <laughs> <laughs> and we finally got our uh, sound system here to be able to tune into your music. Um, oh, it seems there was a setting. Me. I'm so happy about that. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, and I said, I love your shirt, by the way. Well, you know, I, I figured it was in it was in keeping with the uh, eclipse, which is one month away tonight. I, I know. I, I wish I could be traveling with everybody, uh, you know, where I could see the totality event. Well, you can still see a partial. That's really cool, too. That's pretty cool, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, everyone, I uh, think uh, it's good to see uh, good folks here in the uh, auditorium and welcome to the people that are here in the auditorium and to those who are uh, attending us uh, virtually. It's a miracle of uh, modern technology that we're able to have it both ways. Um, anyway, uh, welcome to the March meeting of Orange County Astronomers. Um, and uh, in case you don't know who I am by now, I'm Barbara Toy. I'm your current president. Um, and you see, there are a couple of things I wanted to talk about a little bit before turning it over to Kyle for our announcements. Um, a couple of people have been asking about what's going on with the Orange County star parties. 
Um, we are working to get those back up. Uh, we need to coordinate with Orange County Parks, and that is in process. We're hoping that we'll be having the uh, star parties in Orange County <clears throat> excuse me, um, for the summer season. Um, in the meantime, ANZA is, of course, uh, open to members on the usual basis, and um, we hope to see you out there for maybe even the star party this weekend. Um, another um, topic uh, we have mentioned several times, we're looking for an outreach coordinator. Um, you should be seeing an announcement in the Sirius Astronomer and on the website um, sort of laying out what we are hoping for in the program going forward, which is something closer to the program that Jim Benet designed several years ago and that was tremendously successful <clears throat> successful with the schools and uh, in other locations. Uh, we keep getting calls from schools. We know they're interested in having us have volunteers out there. If you are at all interested in being involved in that program, um, you know, please, send an email to Alan Smallbone, our uh, secretary. Um, we are trying to get that going again. The uh, other thing, uh, you may have seen references to a, a social media coordinator. This is a new uh, position, basically. Well, we've had some people that have sort of been doing it in the past. One is Raisa, one is uh, Andy, who some of you people may remember. Um, but we don't have anybody who is able to keep our social media accounts up to date at this point. I mean, that's really more than Raisa can do with all that he has on his plate right now. Um, we don't, people like me don't have the savvy to do things like that. Um, so if you are at all interested in, uh, in, in handling our social media accounts, do get in touch with Raisa. And, uh, um, you know, that, that is a position you'll also be seeing some announcements about. Um, so without any further ado, let me turn it over to Kyle, who will cover the rest of the announcements uh, before we get on with our great program for the evening. Perfect. Thank you. All right. All right. So welcome new members. Uh, you can either pick up your uh, name badges on the whiteboard, uh, either this month or next month, depending on when you joined. And if uh, you aren't attending in person at any of those meetings, then they'll be mailed to you. Right. Uh, as discussed, the next ANZA Star Party is March 9th. Special interest groups meetings. Astrophysics will be meeting March 15th at 7 p.m. at the Heritage Museum. The beginners class is April 5th at 7.30, and the board meeting is May 3rd. Uh, both of those events will be online. Uh, as Barbara mentioned, uh, outreach events, uh, the program's currently on hold until we get a new coordinator uh, or something similar. Uh, again, contact Alan Smallbone if you're interested in helping with the outreach program. Uh, social media coordinator, again, as Barbara discussed, if you're interested uh, in helping with that, please contact Reza. Uh, please remember for everyone in person that there's coffee, donuts, and water available for purchase at the near the library entrance for one dollar each. The uh, club's Adopt a Scope program is currently up and running. Uh, you can go on the website as shown here under Resources and Adopt a Scope to see the club's uh, current inventory as well as the sample adoption agreement. And there's more information about the program if you are interested in that program. The Serious Astronomer newsletter is always looking for items of interest. If you uh, would like to, if you think you have anything that would be interesting, please contact Dave Fisher and he will review those items of interest. Uh, some things we look for there normally uh, good to have published can be articles, images, observations, trip reports, club news, ads for equipment for sale or anything similar. Uh, please remember everyone always gets the newsletter mailed to them, a hard copy. However, if you would like to opt out of receiving a hard copy, please contact Charlie. The newsletter is always available to all club members uh, in electronic format on the club website. Reminders, uh, if you have a pad at ANSA, please help with keeping the weeds clear of your pad. 
And please help at the observatory, Anza House, football field, and other common areas as you are able to. The uh, 2024 eclipse is coming up next month, April 8th. Uh, you can see the path of totality there. Uh, if you haven't been making your plans, if you're planning on going, get to it. And uh, there's more information at the link there, or you can Google. It's widely available on the internet. And the next meeting will be April 12th. Next will be Chris Butler with, with the WhatsApp presentation. Thank you. And now we are getting ready for What's Up with our own wonderful Chris Butler. Please welcome him. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you all here and present and in person and also out there in the wilds of Internet land. Um, let's see. Yeah, we. I don't have my presentation up on the screen, so I'm just I could I could mess around with things, but I've seen live from Anza too many times and I know what's going to happen. Right. I'll end up getting cable TV on there or, or something. Oh, there, well, there we go. It's all right. It's there. It, fantastic. Yeah. All right. Is that? Yeah, it's, it, it, we're seeing it everywhere. We got two screens. Uh, here. It's not it's showing on our screen. side yet. It's oh, OK. Well, sharing is caring. So let's, uh, share, let's share get the to screen. sharing. Just a moment. This is a four engineer problem. <laughs> oh. It's worth waiting for, folks. Let me tell you, there's never been a WhatsApp presentation like this in my history of doing it. This will blow your mind. Um, <laughs> oh, share screen. Okay. So we have, this is a multilingual situation. Sam speaks Mac and I p speak PC. So we're having to do some translation. I'm sorry. Okay. I think, I think, I think we've kind of got it. And let me, let me actually, we're a couple slides ahead. There we go. Uh, if, do the uh, folks in internet land see this? Yes, we're all good. Yes, you do. And the folks at home see it. The folks right here see it. Fantastic. We're ready. Um, let's talk about what's going on in the sky right now. The green lettering, of course, referring to it being March, and it is uh, it is that Irish time of year. Um, you may have been noticing that day and night are about equal right now. That's true. We're coming up on the big event, uh, meaning the equinox will be coming up. Details in a moment. Uh, but this is the time of year where day and night are approximately equal. Astronomers like the very, very long nights, of course. Sorry to disappoint you, but we're going to have more time uh, with sunshine uh, from here on out through the rest of the year till uh, the autumnal equinox. So the uh, daylight hours hours will be more very soon. That equinox that we mentioned, equinoct, of course, in your German, that does mean equal night, so equal day and night lengths. That's going to occur all over the, the northern hemisphere at exactly 8.06, well, and maybe a few seconds, um, on uh, Tuesday, March 19th. Um, as far as the phases of the moon, uh, tonight we are closing in on the dark of the moon. New moon will occur on March 10th. Uh, interestingly, there is no eclipse that is going to occur this time around. There are times during the year where the moon and its orbital plane are aligned such that eclipses are possible. Um, and there are times, uh, other times of the year where it's lined up so that the moon misses the sun's disk by a long way. It also misses the Earth's shadow on the other side when you have a full moon. But when you're lined up, there's a danger of eclipses happening. And while the big show is, of course, the solar eclipse we've already talked about on April 8th, uh, notice we are almost lined up because our full moon on March 25th the moon will clip the edge of the Earth's shadow barely. 
It is a very shallow penumbral eclipse, meaning the moon will, the full moon will only dim a tiny bit. You may not even notice it, but the main exciting thing about it, it means we're coming up on an alignment where eclipses can happen. And next month, there will be, of course, eclipses. Um, already mentioned the big event for uh, the uh, next month on April 8th, we have the solar eclipse. Not only will that allow people in Los Angeles to see a partial eclipse, there will be a partial here, see Griffith Observatory's website or other websites for more information. Uh, but also this is a rare opportunity for people who want to see the total eclipse to spend more on a single airplane ticket than they have ever spent in their lives. So, yeah, you won't be flying first class, but you'll feel like you paid for it. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, good luck to all of our Eclipse viewers out there who are going to chase this one down. If you do get to see it, it is worth it. If you miss this one, definitely catch one sometime soon when you can. Um, as far as running down the planets... Uh, Mercury, if you're a Mercury fan, Mercury is a very, very low in the sunset right now. Not a good time to catch it. However, uh, it is starting to rise up and toward the end of the month, March 24th. It will actually be a very good elongation, as we call it, peaking up out of the sunset. So if you want to catch Mercury, this is a good apparition of Mercury in the evening, low in the sunset, figure from about, oh, March 20th through uh, maybe April 1st or so, that, that would be the time to catch it. You have to catch it pretty quick because Mercury does move fast. It's those winged shoes. Um, as far as Venus, uh, there really, there are a lot of planets that are just not cooperating. And right now, Venus is one of them, very low in the east at sunrise. I'll give you details on that. Uh, you'll see it on a map and you'll understand a lot of the planets are hiding this month. Uh, Mars, same routine. <laughs> Mars, not only is Mars very much not at its best, um, it is in your telescope approximately the same size as a beryllium atom. Um, meaning Mars is not looming huge right now. It's back on the other side of the sun. It's dim, you know, uh, but I'll, I'll show you why. It's also back uh, behind the sun really right now. Uh, Jupiter is really your number one attraction in the early evening hours. Uh, I was just out looking at it at, outside the hall here, and it is still standing high in the west as evening darkens, but it does set reasonably soon, right? It does set by 10 o'clock at night, so you got to catch it relatively early. Saturn also hiding, basically, uh, in the morning sky. Uh, Uranus is not far from Jupiter. So if you want to catch Uranus, you could. It, it too, is setting relatively early, but you can catch it in the evenings. Uh, Neptune is behind the sun right now, which somewhat reduces its visibility. Um, and then Pluto is also way off in the morning sky, and it doesn't get up high before the sky lightens. So the planets really seem to be uncooperative. They're just not showing up very much. Um, I mentioned Jupiter is the really the star attraction as far as planets. This beautiful uh, photograph or, or image was uh, shot by Christopher Goh. Um, and this gives an impression of what Jupiter looks like in the telescope I wish I had. Uh, not necessarily the way it looks in the telescope I actually have. Uh, but you can definitely check it out and its moons in the evening. Now, if you don't want to check out Jupiter, but you're still in a solar system kind of mood, uh, there are some other things you can do. Um, in the exotics category, we have a comet, uh, Comet uh, 12P Pons Brooks. Uh, this is not the kind of comet that causes accidents on the 405. It's not quite that level, but it has risen to naked eye visibility. It's come up through magnitude six now. And that means if you're out in a dark sky site, you could see it as, as a little fuzzy spot. Um, and it is expected to brighten more, maybe about magnitude 4.5 when it is at its brightest uh, around April 21st. So it is an unusually bright comet, but not, you know, terrifyingly bright. Um, as far as where it is in the sky, it's not far from the Andromeda galaxy. I'll point it out. I actually I marked it on some charts that you'll see of the whole sky. And you can see where it is. Um, but one really interesting, funny thing about it is uh, where it is, uh, was not. it's not too far from where the sun is. And if you see the total solar eclipse, 
you may be able to see the comet next to the sun. So for those of you who are going out and you've spent all that money on the plane ticket, throw the comet in with everything else. Uh, looking at the all sky chart at seven o'clock, just after the sky has really started to darken properly, um, you do see Comet 12P marked there off in the northwest. Uh, you do need to catch it relatively soon because it will be setting relatively early. Obviously, again, you need a telescope to find this thing right now or a good pair of binoculars in a dark sky. Jupiter, you do not need a pair of binoculars to find. It is the brightest thing in the sky at this time. Uh, Uranus, you can see, is not very far away. And I've thrown in the planet, or well, the minor planet, I think. <laughs> Vesta, it's not technically. It's among the largest of the asteroids. Why am I throwing in asteroids? Guilt. Just plain old guilt. Because there aren't any freaking planets to look at, all right? So I'm throwing in asteroids, rusted beer cans, uh, you know, uh, a, a piece of toast with your favorite saint's impression on it, anything, just so you guys have something to look at, all right? Now, asteroid Vesta is one of the brightest of all the asteroids. It's about magnitude 8. You can see it in a telescope, um, and it is reasonably well-placed there off the horns of Taurus the Bull. Um, what's it going to look like? It's going to be small, and it's going to be star-like, which is to say aster it will that's where the word comes from meaning star like if we give it a couple hours here and we let jupiter and uranus start going over into the west uh you can see it does start setting relatively soon so you needed to have finished up your jupiter time by now probably um and uh, you have a longer time there with vesta you can see the the glorious softly glowing band of the milky way which we all enjoy here in orange county is it uh doesn't exist in our skies. Um, but if you're out in the desert or something, you know, or if there's an earthquake, you might get to see it if all the power grid fails. Um, I do want to direct your attention a little bit farther to the east, to the constellation of Leo. Leo is the one I'm going to look at right now. That's because it's already well up at this hour. It's going to be up almost all night. This is a convenient constellation with an obvious pattern. And because it's a zodiac constellation, everybody's heard of it. So if you're telling your neighbors, I'm looking at Leo, they'll pretend to be interested. Um, and you've got other famous constellations that are rising up at this time. Up in the north uh, east, you've got Ursa Major, the Great Bear, of course, with the Big Dipper star pattern in the middle of it. That's wonderful. Uh, you've got constellations like uh, the Gemini Twins are just about all the way at the top of the sky right now. Uh, and then down a little bit farther to the south, we have the constellation of Hydra, which is both the largest and the longest of all the constellations. There's a lot to look at at this time, but I'm focusing on Leo because it is both conveniently placed and it's really distinctive. You really can notice it. By midnight, Leo will be all the way at its highest and that's when the big telescopes come out and the people who don't have a hobby really, but an illness, uh, at this point, they need to be looking in Leo because there's some great things to find in Leo the lion. Leo the lion has the advantage of actually kind of sort of looking like something. Um, I don't feel too guilty when I admit most constellations don't really look like anything. But in this case, yes, there are a pattern of bright stars just about in the center there, which with a little bit of imagination and perhaps an edible, I don't know, um, could be seen as being a lion. Uh, Leo the lion, it's a recumbent lion, which is to say it is just lion there. Um, yeah, the shows. I told you this. What's up? It's it's a barn burner. This is an amazing one. Um, but this a constellation. Not only is it one of the famous zodiac constellations, meaning the ecliptic path runs through here, so that the sun actually passes through these constellations as the uh, Earth orbits the sun. We see the sun in different directions. It passes through here in August. My daughter was born in August, so technically she's a Leo. It means nothing, but uh, uh, it is interesting that the moon, the sun, and the planets can be here. And sometimes that can be really spectacular. Notice how close the ecliptic path passes to the star Regulus, the brightest of Leo's stars. So you can get spectacular conjunctions, except, again, no planets in Leo right now. 
Notice how many of the stars have names. Stars have names uh, when they're important, you know, or they're in important constellations. And this constellation being a zodiac constellation with bright stars, many of the stars do have lots of good names there. Um, in red here are marked the positions of some galaxies. Now, I know some of you are fleeing from the room because you're saying, galaxies, whoa, this is a little serious. I didn't come here to talk about this kind of stuff. I'm new to the hobby. Uh, I get that. I understand galaxies are, they're fainter, they're farther away, they're more mysterious. But if you've got a telescope that's in the ballpark of a six to an eight inch, I have an eight inch telescope myself, uh, you can, even from the city, find some galaxies. And just about the easiest of them all is in Leo, just about. The Andromeda galaxy is in a class by itself, but apart from that one, um, you will notice below the star Zazma, love that name, and Chertan, uh, if you extend a line down from Zazma through Chertan in the back part of Leo the Lion, you come to the mark there that says M6566. That is the first galaxy uh, group apart from M31 I ever saw through a telescope. They are bright enough to be seen from the city, and they are very distinctive. And notice they're right there below the pattern of the lion, a pattern you can really see. M9596 and M105 is kind of below the middle of the lion. It's a little bit harder to find by hand. Why am I even saying that? These days, everybody pushes the stupid buttons on the telescope, and it just goes there, right? We all know this. There's no need for folks to know the sky anymore. The telescope will birth the baby and tell you a story, too, all right? But if you wanted to find it with a telescope yourself, that's the way to do it. These things are very close to the pattern of Leo. Now, if you want to go a little bit farther, you're saying, wait, you're not challenging me, Chris. Push me a little bit in this hobby. I'm going to say, go for the boogers. And the boogers would be NGC 2903 is another galaxy, which is right off the nose of Leo. So Mufasa there blew a, a green and slippery thing out. And that's NGC 2903. It's a very nice galaxy. Uh, also within the reach amateur telescopes. And then even farther, NGC 30, uh, 3521 down in the south part of Leo, uh, you can see out the way at the bottom of the diagram, that's another one you might hunt. And we got some pictures of some of these galaxies. Here's a good example of why you can never trust photographs in astronomy. Uh, the M6566 pair is on the right of your screen. I mentioned that those were detectable from the city, and they're, e they're pretty darned easy to see in a 6- or 8-inch telescope. But that other galaxy over on the other side, NGC 3268, beautiful edge-on spiral, you would think, well, there it is. However, it's dimmer than the others. And when I would look from the city, I could see the other two galaxies, but not a glimpse of the other from the city. That was my own experience. Other people who are frankly lying told me they can see it. Um, there's some bragging in astronomy. You know how it is. Um, but this is a good example where the sky brightness can make something just about invisible. You need a bright galaxy here for the city. And the M6566 pair is a very good one to start with. Um, here is a wide field view on your left showing the M9596 pair on the right uh, of the, uh, the photograph on the left. And a group of others as well. It's a whole collection of different galaxies. Beautiful uh, detailed photograph of M95 on the right. Here's the uh, boogers I promised, NGC 2903. Uh, beautiful with a uh, big bar in the center of that galaxy. It's a good place for a bar. Um, NGC 3521 is one of my favorite words in astronomy, a flocculent spiral. Not flatulent. That's a different type of spiral. Um, there are a few others. If you're thinking, you have not challenged me, dude. I've got like, I have a 200-inch telescope in my backyard. And I want to find something, okay? And I got a divorce for, over the telescope, and I got to make it count. So that's fine. Almost all the little green shapes are galaxies. 
they are scattered all the way across Leo, all the way through. But you'll notice there's that mob over on the left. That's the Virgo galaxy cluster in the neighboring constellation. Um, so you can just keep all night long. If you don't have any friends, just stay up with the galaxies and look at these little fuzzy things and everything will be great. Um, just kidding, of course, some astronomers do have lots of friends, um, but the Virgo galaxy cluster is also there. Um, there are more galaxies I mentioned, all sorts of different ones. Here's NGC 3455. Here's a wild group, something going on with, they're, they're definitely having a party around NGC 3190, interacting galaxies. Um, look at 3187 up there. Wow. I want to see that with those spiral arms flinging out like a, like a Spanish dancer. Beautiful. There's one that reminds me a little bit of uh, another pair of galaxies up in uh, Ursa Major, M8182, but it's a different pair. 3454 and 3455 in Leo. Uh, and then in the tough category, right next to the bright star Regulus is a close by but incredibly faint galaxy. It's actually going around our Milky Way galaxy, a dwarf galaxy. Leo 1 is the schmutz. That's a technical term in the center of that picture. Barely visible. And while you're at it, Leo 2 is visible there. And if you want to go farther and farther and farther with this, there are, I believe, five dwarf galaxies just in Leo for you to hunt down. So it just gets more and more and more exotic. Where is the edge of this hobby? How far can you go with this in Leo? You could find Wolf 359, which is an incredibly faint star that you could find with your telescope. And you'll notice the Borg are listed on this slide. And does anyone has anyone heard of Wolf 359 before? Yes. Uh, the reason for this is that this is a star system that was referenced in Star Trek. It was referenced the Battle of Wolf 359, where the bad guy Borgs were going to attack us, and they had some kind of huge fight. But the, the reason it scared me in that episode when I heard, ah, Wolf 359, no, surely not, is because this is the third closest star to us in the entire universe. It's Yeah, it's Alpha Centauri, Barnard Star, and then Wolf 359. So this is only 7.9 light years away in a galaxy 100,000 across. It's one of our closest neighbors and is, believe it or not, a famous star. And it's hiding there in Leo. And I bet none of you have ever dropped by. You've never sent a postcard. You don't visit on holidays. And it is about time you stop by and have a look at Wolf 359. I'm going to leave Leo here and just uh, wrap up the evening here. Leo, where it is at midnight. Uh, if you spend all night dancing the stars away, by 5.30, the sky is starting to lighten up, 5.30 in the morning. And you can see where all the other planets are. They're hiding in the morning sky very low. Pluto's over there, Mars, Venus, you can see right before the sun comes up, uh, and uh, Saturn. And tonight, even the moon is hiding there. So... That's why I gave you Vesta, because I care. Um, so a last thing for you here, obviously in March, thinking St. Patrick's uh, thoughts. Um, I will wish you all good luck with this picture of the Dark Sky Park in County Mayo, Ireland. They actually have a Dark Sky Park in Ireland. I think that is wonderful. So to thank them and to thank all of you who have included that. And with that, I will flee in terror. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much, Chris, for yet another great presentation of yours. And uh, what a wonderful thing that they have in Ireland, the uh, Dark Sky Park. Um, so let me, without any further ado, go into introducing our speaker for tonight. Um, our speaker tonight received his PhD from University of Cap Cambridge in 1993, where he studied the expansion of the universe. He did postdoctoral research work at Durham University and at the University of Victoria in Canada, where he was a national fellow of the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics. In 1999, he moved to the University of Waterloo, where he's currently a professor. Please join me in welcoming Mike Hudson. Mike. 
Thank you, Reza and everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, so as you said, I, I used to study, I still do study the expansion of the universe, but I have some other interests as well. Um, so tonight I wanna tell you about uh, a topic of great interest to me, and I think to many astronomers worldwide, goes under the name of gravitational lensing. Uh, so let me share my screen with you. Um, and I will make sure that it is getting the audio. Uh, that's that one. Good. All right. Um, so I've given it this title, Cosmic Mirages. Um, and I find cause the you know, the concept of a mirage is a little bit more familiar to many people than lenses, and it really is a little bit more like a mirage than a than a lens in the in the classical sense, as you would be, you know, you would be familiar with if, for example, if you build your own telescopes. Um, so the power of these things is that they let us see the dark stuff in the universe indirectly, and I'll try to explain that as we go along. Um, then the little animation uh, that you see on the right, you know, if I was in the same room as you and, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 feet away and a small uh, moon, a small black hole with the mass of roughly the moon were to pass, uh, you know, in the air between us, uh, that's sort of the visual effect you would get. Um, and if you look very closely, uh, you'll see it's kind of tricky to see because it goes by pretty fast, uh, but you'll see that you can actually see multiple images of, for example, my eyes. And we call that strong gravitational lensing when you make multiple images. And then you also see at the edges, there's some distortion. Uh, there's not multiple images of my face, but you know, if you look at the lines on the shirt, they're kind of warped and distorted. And that is what we call weak gravitational lensing. You don't make separate images, but you do distort. And both those things are very powerful. So I'm gonna to try to give you, you know, I could give an entire lecture course on gravitational lensing that would take many, many hours. I'm just gonna give you a few highlights. Okay, some of the fun things and a little bit about it, a little of the history uh, of, uh, of this topic. Uh, so here's an outline. I'll sort of just try to explain the basic phenomenon. A little bit of a history about how this was first used. And then I'll give you a few, I would say a few key examples in different areas uh, to uh, whet your appetite for this topic. And the last one is something that I work on myself. So it's a bit of my own research. Uh, so let me explain why I call them mirages. So most of you are familiar with the concept of a mirage. Uh, even if you haven't seen one out on the ocean where you get this sort of so-called Fata Morgana effect, you've often seen them, especially in California where it's hot. Um, you see this effect uh, on the asphalt where it looks like water. And in this example here, uh, you can see there's even a reflection of this minivan here in the water. Uh, and of course, the water isn't water at all, um, but it's doing the same thing that the water does is you're seeing the sky uh, not reflected, but refracted. So if you were to draw a diagram of what the light is doing, um, let's imagine you have your observer over here, Albert, uh, and you have your distant vehicle. Uh, so in the normal air, the light travels more or less in a straight line to your eyeball, uh, but when you have this uh, heated layer of air, you have a changing refractive index uh, close to the ground, and that variable refractive index can actually cause the light rays to bend. And so you can have the light reaching you coming from two different directions. Now, from your eye's perspective, this is what's really happening, but your eye sees, of course, things coming from some angle. And that's the basis, of course, of our vision and our photography is we see the angle of the incoming light. And so we perceive this minivan to actually be at a different location, uh, essentially. And it's all coming from the, you know, these atmospheric effects and changing refractive index. So that's how 
atmospheric mirages work in a nutshell. And gravitational lensing is a lot like that. Uh, the major difference is it's not an atmosphere and a changing refractive index that's leading to this bent path of the light, but rather gravity itself. Okay, so let's redo it now with gravity. Again, we've got your observer, distant star. Um, in reality, it's usually a galaxy because this works better on larger scales. You have some mass here. It doesn't have sort of drawn like it's a black hole, but it could be any mass um, that's sufficiently massive to cause a significant bending. So in this setup, you know, you have a, a light ray that maybe would have missed the observer, but the gravity of this object is, has bent it into the observer's telescope. Okay, and so the observer then sees that star as if it were over here, even though in reality it's over here. So it may be shocking to you that, in fact, when you take a deep image of the sky, you think you know where everything is, but actually in reality, everything's in a slightly different place. <clears throat> so in the case where you have a, a very large mass, it's also possible that the light can take a different path. Which, sorry, I'll show you in a second. Um, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, all right? So how was this effect first detected and, and what was the significance of this? So gravitational lensing is now more than 100 years old. Um, and it was first measured uh, at a very important time in the history of uh, astronomy and physics. And that is to, as a test of general relativity. And it was measured during the 1919 eclipse. Uh, so I'll explain all that. You've talked about the eclipse up here in Waterloo. Uh, the eclipse is, unfortunately, we're not in the path of totality, but it's not far away, an hour's drive. Um, so we will hope we'll be hoping for clear skies on April the 8th and uh, driving into the path of totality regardless. Um, so historically, Einstein came up with his theory of relativity, uh, as I said, a little bit more than 100 years ago, 1916. And, you know, whenever you have a theory in science, what you want to do is test that theory against the universe, you know, against the observations that you can make. And ideally, your theory will make a prediction, which is different from the prevailing theory at the time, which was Newton's theory of gravity. Newton's theory of gravity had existed for over 250 years at that point. It was very well tested. There were a few little weird problems with, with Newton's theory, and one of those was the precession of the perihelion of the orbit of Mercury. Um, that wasn't fully explained in Newton's theory, but generally it was well accepted. Uh, Einstein was thinking about fundamental principles of gravity. Uh, and as he did so, he first formulated a theory called the special theory of general relativity. And then he, sorry, the special theory of relativity and then the general theory of relativity, which we now just call general relativity or GR for short. Almost everybody says GR. Um, and so what, what Einstein calculated was that, you know, when in that scenario that I just sketched for you, when a light go of a distant star passes by another mass, which is in front of it, which could be a star, it gets bent. And the amount by which it is bent is exactly twice that which you would predict in Newton's theory of gravity. So there was a test that if you could measure this bending, you could tell whether it was general relativity or Newton uh, that was correct. Uh, and the obvious object to use to do the bending was the sun. Uh, but of course the sun, as you astronomers know very well, is very bright. Uh, and it's hard to see the stars when the sun is up. Uh, but it was quickly realized that if you could observe the stars during the eclipse, during an eclipse, um, you could make this measurement. Uh, and so Einstein proposed this in 1916, 
1916, you remember there was major events going on in the world, namely World War I. <laughs> and so as a result, a lot of people were not, you know, as you know, eclipses are very rare. You would have to usually travel to go to one. Uh, and so nothing happened until the war was over. And in 1919, after the war, there was an expedition to, to two different points on the earth to go and observe this take some photographs and measure the position of the stars and compare them with where they are when the sun is not right in front of them. Okay, you guys know what arc seconds are, so I don't have to explain that. Uh, so here is a, a later picture of Albert Einstein uh, in Cambridge, England, talking to uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, who was uh, the one that led the expedition back in 1919. Um, and so here was the path of totality then. Uh, Africa here, across the South Atlantic and into Brazil. So there were two, two teams, two missions. They brought their equipment and they made the measurement. And if we, let me go back to what the numbers are. General relativity says 1.75 arc seconds. Newton, just under an arc second, okay? Uh, and the two teams measured 1.98 with some uncertainty. Okay, that was in Africa. And in Brazil, there were two different data sets, different telescopes. They measured 1.61. So this was clearly in the camp of Einstein. And that was one of the, perhaps the major piece of, of uh, major observational confirmation that really showed that uh, Einstein's theory was correct. Okay, it was a major news story. New York Times, 1919. I love this headline, right? Lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Einstein theory triumphs. Stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. <laughs> Fantastic. Einstein became a huge celebrity after this. He would tour the world and got the red carpet everywhere and became very famous. Um, so that was really the first measurement of this effect and, and incredibly important in the history of science as well. <clears throat> All right, so the, with that background in mind, let me give you a few examples. Um, and the most spectacular, well, uh, you can debate about it, but one of the most spectacular things are strong lensing. Uh, that's where you form multiple images, okay? Um, so let's go back to this picture that we saw before. So here's a star and we see it at the location of the blue star. But if the lens is, oops, excuse me. Sorry, I managed to get it into the wrong mode. Um, if, the, if this is massive enough, you can have sufficient bending that there are other paths that the light can take where you also see it. So here's an example. Imagine a light ray coming from here. It would normally miss you, but because of the bending of the lens, it is also deflected into your telescope. So now you see a second image of the same object, sorry, excuse me, coming from two different directions at the same time. Okay, so you've made two images from one thing because the light is taking two different paths uh, that can reach you. And that only happens when there's sufficient bending, which only happens when you have sufficient mass because the more mass you have, the more bending you've got. Okay, so here's another little animation which tries to show that in uh, sort of in 3D, right? So that quasar is a very distant bright point-like object in the distant universe and in this case, its light is going through a galaxy. And there are four paths in this case that the light can take, which all reach your telescope. And the image up in the little inset in the top uh, right is an actual image of this system. And we see a quadruple image of this quasar. All right. And we're sure it's we're sure it's the same object because lensing is achromatic, by which I mean that all wavelengths are bent the same way. And so when you take a spectrum of each of these four images, they look essentially identical, which doesn't happen when you take two random quasars in the sky. 
So we know these are multiple images of the same thing. It's pretty spectacular. So you can create this effect yourself uh, if you have, treat yourself to a glass of wine <clears throat> and you have a, a, a candle. Um, the, you know, the base of a standard wine glass uh, has much of the similar effects of many of the gravitational lenses. So you hold it in front of the light at different angles. You can see uh, these things, which we call giant arcs. Okay, that's when you have an incomplete. Here's another example of arcs. Or if you have a perfect alignment, you can even form something called an Einstein ring. That's where an object, an image of a single object gets distorted into an entire ring shape. All right, and, and of course you get to finish the wine once you've done the experiment. <clears throat> so here's a spectacular example of a cluster of galaxies, okay? Um, it's mentioned in the introduction about the Virgo cluster. The Virgo cluster is a very nearby one, nearby cluster of galaxies. This is a distant cluster of galaxies. In clusters of galaxies, most of the, most of the galaxies are elliptical. So they're of this uh, yellowy orange and kind of amorphous shape that you see here. These are bright stars um, with the diffraction pattern from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is where this image is from. And if you look very, very closely, you'll see, so the yellow elliptical galaxies are in the foreground. Most of the things which are blue are distant galaxies in the distant universe, and they are behind the cluster. So those are the ones that can be multiply imaged. Um, so here is a spiral galaxy up here, which you may be able to make out. I'll show a blow up in a second. And this spiral galaxy actually has another counterpart image down here. Okay. And there's a third one, which is even harder to see, which is hidden inside here. But that's not the most spectacular thing about this. We've seen this multiple imaging before, but this one was special. <clears throat> okay, so let me blow it up a little bit and see a little bit better. So this galaxy here is the same as this one here. And hidden underneath this big elliptical galaxy, there's a third image. So they don't look the same because the images in the process of being lensed are warped. So they're not exactly carbon copies, they're distorted images of each other. In particular, this image is being distorted again by another elliptical galaxy, this yellow thing that's in front, which is warping it further, but it's only affecting this image here. So the amazing thing about this particular system is it's also a time machine. And I'll explain what I mean. <clears throat> In this galaxy here, this is a zoom in that we were looking at before. And part of this spiral galaxy is itself being multiply imaged. And in that multiple image, there are these four yellow dots. That is a supernova, which exploded in the arm of that spiral galaxy and was lensed four times by this other elliptical galaxy, which is in the front of just this particular image. Okay, so this is a double lensing effect. The cluster of galaxies as a whole, which is mostly dark matter, we can't see it, is making the multiple images. And then this particular galaxy is also making multiple images of a piece of this galaxy again. And in that piece, a supernova goes off. And Hubble was lucky enough to capture that and capture the four images. And the people who studied this um, realized, as others had proposed before, that a, a product of these different images is that the light takes different amounts of time to reach you. Okay, so super, a bright supernova like this would go typically for maybe a month, right? And then it would fade away. Um, so they studied it and they realized that this, this image was taken in 2014 with the four supernova. And they said, well, a supernova might have appeared in this distant galaxy 
this other image of the same galaxy in 1995. That was the path that took the least amount of time to get to us, so it got there first. <clears throat> this one is in the middle, and it, this extra lensing, these four images appeared all at the same time. And they predicted in the third image here that a supernova would appear in the future at the time this observation was made. And they estimated sometime between 2015 and 2020. Um, and amazingly, this was, of course, observed by Hubble. It became an important target. Um, and so let's zoom in on the, on the inner part. <clears throat> So here is where the location of that same arm, you can, can't see it super well, but there's a, because it's hidden under the bright light of the elliptical galaxies, highly distorted third image of the spiral galaxy. It was predicted to, that it should occur right here. Okay, and so in November, December, there's nothing there. In October of 2015, there's nothing there. But in December of 2015, there is a supernova at that spot. Truly amazing, right? So this taking years of difference in time for the light to go on these different paths. So that's one of the most spectacular examples of strong gravitational lensing where you use this multiple imaging for, for different purposes. Okay, let me give you a different example, which is an... We don't have a good name for the kind of lensing that black holes do. I was talking to my colleague in the hall just today, and I was saying, you know, we gotta we gotta coin a name for the lensing by black holes because it's it's even more extreme. So in the in the images that I showed you in the little cartoon that I showed you here, typically the bending might be a few arc minutes. Okay. Um, at most, uh, around the sun, it was a few arc seconds. But if the light is very close to the what's called the event horizon of the black hole itself, it can actually go through 180, 360 degrees, which is truly amazing. Nobody has a good name for that, but we need to coin one. <clears throat> All right, so let me go back to talk about black holes a bit more. So this is an artist's impression of a black hole. Um, and the, there's a black hole in the middle, but orbiting around the black hole, there's a plane, a circular plane of material, of hot gas, a little bit like Saturn's rings or something else. It's called an accretion disk because the material is slowly moving in while it orbits on a very, very gentle spiral. Um, so that's artist's impression. Here's the Hollywood impression. So that's a clip from Interstellar, the movie. And so you might ask, what is going on with this weird shape? What's happening there? So what you're seeing there is, imagine you have a black hole. You can't see the black hole itself, but you can see this light from the accretion disk, right? That's this stuff here, okay? And what you see up here, is light, the accretion disk is, all, is flat. It's almost like two dimensional. What you're seeing is light from the back of the accretion disk that's coming up and over the top of the black hole and pointing towards you. And likewise on the underside, okay? It's going down and it's pointing up towards you. So it's quite <coughs> extreme lensing where the gravity is so strong that it's warping the light and causing it to go through huge angles, okay? So here's the famous picture uh, of, the, um, of the black hole around, uh, the, uh, sorry, the accretion disk and a, a thing called the jet around the black hole in the M87 galaxy in the center of the Virgo cluster. Extremely famous. People say, why is it so blurry? What they don't realize is <laughs> that, you know, Nobody has even ever gotten close to this, right? And it's just remarkable that you can do this. Uh, it's a huge leap in technology. Uh, 
to, to even resolve us and see the dark hole in the middle, which is where the black hole is. This is the same kind of accretion disk as you have an inter, interstellar. Um, that made all the news. Um, above the fold, my colleague is happy to point out <clears throat> in, in the major newspapers. Uh, this is the guy I'm talking about, Avery Broderick. He's one of the key people uh, on the this ev so-called event horizon team. The event horizon's the name for that magic part of the black hole where once you go in it, you're not coming back out. <clears throat> so they actually do try to figure out from uh, computer models what that accretion disk looks like. And in addition to the accretion disk and the artist's impression here, the, these black holes often also have jets, which are bipolar um, ejection of material coming out from very close to the black hole and going out above and below the disk. So they think that we're looking at that M87 almost face on, like face on to the accretion disk and the jet is coming towards us. Um, and so in the computer model, <clears throat> they can make predictions of what it might look like. Okay, and this is one of their examples of a simulation of the accretion disk and the jets as we would see it if we had perfect vision. Um, and this is very extremely challenging to code up on the computer, because you have to put in the more complicated dynamics of general relativity, not just, you know, simple gravity that you would have from Newton. So it's extremely challenging just to produce those kind of videos. So at the end of the day, um, you know, you think, well, these don't look the same, but that's because the one on the left is a computer model at very high resolution, and we only see it at lower resolution. Right, it's still amazing what we can see. Probably the thing on the right is a blurry version of the thing on the left. So that's what I would call an example of extreme, I, I think we should call it hyperlensing or something. That's what I was telling Avery, but uh, he wasn't so convinced. We need a good name for it. <clears throat> All right, so the last topic um, is, is closer to my own area of research. Uh, and I'll show you some results from a previous project. Uh, and I think the real power, although these examples of strong lensing uh, by clusters of galaxies are, are spectacular and beautiful and very powerful scientifically, the, the ultimate power of gravitational lensing is its ability to actually see dark matter. Okay, we can't see dark matter by because it doesn't shine, as I'm going to explain in a second, but we can see it through its gravitational effects. It's going to warp the background galaxies. And by measuring the warping, we can figure out where the dark matter is, even though we can't see it. And that's the amazing power of it. It lets us make maps of dark matter. Um, so I'll show you one example of that. So dark matter, we think, you know, if you took the energy mass budget of the whole universe, remember Einstein said that energy and matter are basically the same thing. So we think the universe is, is you know, in terms of that budget is mostly dark stuff. Uh, that's what the current cosmological model says, and it's in pretty good shape. Uh, we understand the, that if we posit these properties, what effects these things would have on the expansion of the universe and the gravitational lensing that we see. So that's what's led us to the current model where only 5% of the stuff in the universe is normal visible matter, you know, made of carbon, hydrogen, normal stuff from the periodic table of the elements. The rest is something unknown, uh, but it splits into two categories. Some of it is what is called dark matter. So that's believed to be something which is far outweighs the normal matter by a factor of five or six. 
And then there's something also mysterious, which I'm not going to talk about, called dark energy, which seems to be causing the universe's expansion to accelerate. That dark energy is smooth, and smooth stuff is hard to measure with gravitational lensing. The dark matter is lumpy, and we can measure it. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit more about dark matter. I'll tell you what we know. Um, we know that it's dark. And by that, I mean it doesn't shine. Uh, it doesn't reflect any light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't scatter light. That's how we see everything, of course, in the universe is by one of these mechanisms. But through its gravity, it does bend the light. And that's the key. We don't, we think it's probably some kind of particle. Um, we think it's non-interacting. And by, by that, I mean that there are dark matter particles, probably billions of them going through your body every second. Uh, but they don't feel your body. They're like ghosts. It sounds kind of crazy, but we know such particles exist already. They're called neutrinos. Uh, they come, they are made in the fusion reactions in the sun, and they have a similar property that they're ghost particles that also pass through us. And we don't react or interact with them at all, but except extremely rarely. And so from those extreme rare interactions, we know they exist. Dark matter is probably not a neutrino because a neutrino is not massive enough to have the properties that we think dark matter has, you know, on a, the mass of the individual particle, but it could be something like that. Uh, what we know it's not is we know the dark matter is not black holes because as far as we know, black holes are made from stars and there are limits on how much normal material could have been made into stars. We know it's not antimatter. We know it's not some kind of mysterious clouds of normal matter, lost socks, whatever you want. That's dryer lint, you know, that sort of thing. So it could be a new subatomic particle. But we really don't know for sure. We haven't detected it directly on Earth, only indirectly through its gravitational effect. So it's important to understand what this stuff is and study it. And that's what gravitational lensing lets us do. Um, so I'm going to show you, to motivate what I'm trying to measure here, I'm going to show you in a second a simulation of the formation of large-scale structure in the universe. Um, and so this is uh, something you run on a supercomputer. You just put in, in this case, there's no complicated physics. There's only these dark matter particles, which sound complicated, but in terms of their physics properties, they're actually very simple because they only interact through gravity and that makes it easy to code. So here's what happens. The universe is expanding. Okay, it starts off almost smooth and the expansion moves everything apart. Um, but while that's happening, structure is actually forming in something that we call the cosmic web. Okay, so as time goes on, you can see there's a little clock up in the top right. The universe is about 14 giga years old, so it hasn't got that far yet. Um, the universe has gone from being smooth to being kind of lumpy. There are regions which are kind of colored artificially white here, where there's lots of matter, lots of dark matter, and the regions that are dark are what we call cosmic voids, regions with very low densities of dark matter. Okay, so that continues to expand and grow. I'll let it run to the end. 13.9 uh, is about where we are right now. So the structure that we think dark matter has is probably very similar to this. Um, where you see these knots, like you see bright knots like here and here, 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 and so on. Uh, those regions are called dark matter halos. They're mm, roughly spherical balls of dark matter. And we think in the centers of those are where galaxies live. So our own Milky Way galaxy is probably living in the center of one of these dark matter halos. Um, and that's the basic fundamental picture of structure formation. Let me show you a similar movie but so you can see the detail a little bit better, I, what I've done is I've taken out the expansion. So I've like rescaled it so you always see the same piece of the universe. All right, I've removed the expanding part, but you'll still see the, the structure form. Okay, so 
Here there's expansion has been removed. We can see it goes from being smooth to more and more lumpy as time goes on. And as time goes on, matter collects into dark matter halos and it leaves these cosmic voids which become more and more empty. Okay, beautiful, beautiful simulations. So you can sort of see why it's called the cosmic web because in addition to these dark matter halos, which are shown here and here and here and maybe up here and here and here, in addition to those halos, we also, they're also connected by strands of dark matter. We call those filaments, like filaments in a spider web. Now you wouldn't, even if you had a great telescope, of course, you can't see these filaments directly. Now, if you, were, if you had a fantastic telescope and you could map out the galaxies, you might notice that the galaxies tend to lie along a chain. And that's something that you could observe, the bright spots that are the galaxies, but you can't actually see the filament itself because the filament is mostly dark matter. Okay, so the scale of this, just to give you an idea, is something like, 700 and 700 million light years in size. Um, and I, what I'm going to focus on to, to give you an idea is I'm just going to pick a pair of galaxies, this one and this one, which are maybe 30 to 50 million light years apart. And we're going to focus on those two and the filaments between them. Okay, so this line here. So we did this using... Uh, a project, a gravitational lensing project, it was called CFHT Lens. Um, and that took deep images of the night sky from the Canada, France, Hawaii telescope. Uh, this is an older project. I'll tell you about our latest stuff right at the end. Uh, Hawaii telescopes are fantastic. Here's a, here's a movie taken by, uh, uh, made by one of my uh, collaborators and colleagues who worked at the Canada, France, just give you an idea of what it's like to be observed. The shadow of the mountain as the sun is setting. So we took data from that telescope that you saw there, the Canada France Hawaii telescope, which is excellent imaging quality and had at the time the biggest camera, uh, biggest field of view uh, that was available. Um, it, you know, it's hard work to do this stuff. What we, we estimated we had at least 50 man years of custom software creation to convert the images of the galaxies that we see and measure them very carefully because what we are looking for is the second effect I mentioned, the small distortion of the background galaxies. But once you have the distortion of the galaxies, you can deduce from that where the dark matter is from how they're all distorted in the same kind of way. But it takes a lot of effort to get there. Um, these are long-term projects and they're done by a huge team of people. Here's the team celebrating when we've had our first results at a conference, uh, where am I? I'm here, we're back when I had more hair. Um, it was a while ago. <clears throat> I still work with many of these people, their friends and colleagues. Um, and so I'll cut straight to the chase and show you what we measure. Okay, and it, it got a little bit of press. Um, so what you're seeing here is not an image, it is actually, although the Newsweek calls it an image, it's actually a map of the dark matter made to look like an image. Um, and so in this scale as shown here, 50 million light years roughly. And the color scale is such that white has the highest density of dark matter. And as you go down through red and purple and black, 
you have a lower density of dark matter. Um, so the amazing thing about this was not the fact that you have a galaxy here and a galaxy here. We'd measured this effect before, but for us, the cool thing was we were seeing this bridge, this filament between the two galaxies just in dark matter for the first time. So that was very exciting. Um, okay, so that bridge or filament is the red stuff that's joining them. And we're pretty sure this is real because we can take pairs of galaxies, which we know from their redshifts, we know how far away they are. So we can take pairs of galaxies that we know are physically in 3D close together and measure it. And then we can take pairs of galaxies that, you know, just like you know for stars that you see them close on the sky, but in 3D, they could be different at different depths. The same is true for these galaxies. We can take pairs of where we know that they're at different distances, um, far away from each other. And so there's no bridge between those. So that's a, a test, if you like. Um, so very, this was a very exciting this example of how you can use gravitational lensing to actually do what I think is the really ultimately the most powerful thing to actually make maps of dark matter across the whole sky. Um, and that's our long-term goal is to understand where is the dark matter, how much there is, where it's distributed in the universe. And it's gravitational lensing that really lets us do that. Okay, so just looking forward into the future, um, so we have another project that is working on the ground. The current mission that I'm involved in uh, is called the Euclid Space Telescope. It, it, is a, it is a telescope launched quite recently, uh, just uh, not even a year ago, in July of 2023, by the European Space Agency. Um, and it, because it's up in space, it's free from something that you're all familiar with is the twinkling, the seeing. This is a major nuisance in this, in this gravitational lensing business. You really want to measure the shapes of galaxies very carefully so you can look for this distortion. But if they're blurred out by the atmosphere, that's not a good thing. So this telescope will do it from, from space. Um, and you know, one thing you might wonder is, well, why do we need another space telescope? We have Hubble, we have James Webb. The, the distinction between this and something that I think astronomers can appreciate is not every telescope is the same, not every camera is the same. Hubble's field of view, for example, is tiny. It's only a few arc minutes. This telescope has an enormous camera and an enormous field of view, uh, something like 0.7 degrees on a side. So that's very, very big. And what that will enable it to do, so that's like 100 times bigger than Hubble, roughly, in terms of its area. So Hubble can look at little pinpoint spots on the sky, um, but it cannot make a map of the entire sky. Uh, in 30-odd in years of Hubble, I think it's observed less than 1% of the entire available sky that it could have seen. Uh, whereas this telescope, will over six years survey one third of the entire sky. So when it's finished in scheduled to finish in approximately 2030, um, you will have Hubble resolution images of almost any object that you want that's far enough away from the galactic plane. It'll be quite spectacular. Um, so, I was I enjoyed actually going to the launch, uh, which was in Cape Canaveral. It launched on a, a Falcon 9, SpaceX Falcon 9. There's a story there that it was supposed to launch on the on a Russian Soyuz, but of course this war broke out in Ukraine and the European Space Agency canceled that plan and then started looking for an alternative. And they have their own launch vehicle called Ariane, but it was they were changing models between Ariane 5 and Ariane 6. And you don't want to be the first thing that goes up on the new model. You want to make sure there's a few uh, successful launches without anything blowing up. So uh, it, they negotiated with SpaceX and, and it went up and had a very successful 
uh, a launch from uh, Cape Canaveral, which was great. Uh, very recently, uh, Euclid released some uh, to the media, some of its first images. Um, and so I'll show you um, one of those, the Perseus galaxy cluster. Uh, this is a spectacularly beautiful deep image of a very nearby galaxy cluster. It turns out that nearby galaxies aren't the best for gravitational lensing. Um, you might be able to see the brightest galaxy in here, NGC 1275. If you have a good ground-based telescope, it's, it's a big elliptical galaxy. Um, but what you see in these images is a huge field of view and beautiful high precision photometry and also low, very low surface brightness features, right? So you can see this, that in addition to these big galaxies here, there's a kind of a yellow glow around everything. And that's something we call the intracluster light. So they're stars that are not associated with any one particular galaxy, but they're in the cluster as a whole. And, and Euclid, uh, like Hubble, being in space, uh, you know, you, you guys worry about dark skies, but even in the darkest sky, the sky is still pretty bright. Uh, up in space, it's, uh, it's much, much, much fainter. The major problem in space uh, in terms of background is getting near the zodiacal light. Um, that's the problem in space. So Euclid looks away from the, the, the ecliptic plane to get away from the zodiacal light. Uh, and reduce its background to as low as it can possibly be. Um, so that's its first image. It's going to observe for another six years, and uh, the data is going to be truly spectacular. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, so to wrap up, I've tried to give you a little taste of you know, some of the things that you can see if you could see gravitational lensing. Um, and my hope is that this is giving you enough of a flavor that, you know, gravitational lensing makes you happy, makes you smile. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a wonderful talk. And, and indeed, gravitational lensing makes us uh, smile, uh, like the image that um, you found. That's wonderful. Great. Thank you very much. So now uh, let me tell everybody that the floor is open for questions. Uh, and while you're gathering up your thoughts, uh, people um, online use the Q&A section, please, to send your uh, questions and people in person. Uh, let me start uh, by a little bit since the last thing you talked about was the Euclid telescope and uh, which you actually attended the la launch and is, is a part of. So did I get it correctly? This is a survey only telescope. So it does its job and then sends data. No, no image specific orders for targets. That's correct. That's exactly right. So um, it's different from Hubble. You know, if you know how Hubble works, you apply for time. And uh, if you get time, it points at the object that you care about. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you just said correctly, it's going to just scan the sky and make a giant map, essentially. Uh, so you will get a large number of objects eventually, because they will eventually be included in the map. It's going to miss out on the galactic plane, um, because Euclid is focused mainly on the distant universe. So it's less interested in the stars in our own galaxy and more interested in the distant galaxies, because gravitational lensing is, is done with these distant galaxies. And uh, you, want, you don't want to be confused by the other stars in the Milky Way or have to deal with the obscuration of the dust in the Milky Way. So it actually points away from the Milky Way, and that's why it doesn't cover the whole, um, the whole uh, sky. And is it working in the visible spectrum or infrared? Uh, ultra both. Both. So um, it, it has a very wide band uh, visible filter. And that's the, the filter which is used for uh, the gravitational lensing measurements. Uh, it goes, that filter goes from approximately, I'm trying to remember, maybe it's reddish, but it's quite broad compared to your classic filters. It goes from 500 nanometers or, or 
uh, 5,000 angstroms up beyond, uh, let's say 900 nanometers, something like that. But then in addition to that, it has infrared detectors as well. Um, uh, so there's a dichroic, which splits the light and it observes in the infrared simultaneously. And finally, it has a spectroscopic mode with a, a grism, which, uh, which um, disperses the light and allows you to measure the spectrum of uh, many, many distant galaxies. And so that's his other main project is to make a three-dimensional map of the distribution of galaxies uh, in the distant universe, which will be used to understand this large scale structure, sort of like the image that I, that I showed you. Very nice, very nice. And can you tell me about it? its orbit? Uh, it isn't on the Lagrangian points or yes. is it orbiting the Earth? No, it's, uh, it's at L2 up there with uh, James Webb. <laughs> Hopefully they don't bump into each other. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, look, so now uh, let's turn into the uh, in-person audience. Barbara, do we have any questions there? Uh, question? Yeah, what's the best gas as to what constitutes dark matter? Uh, the question is, what is the best guess as to what constitutes dark matter? The best guess, um, is that it is some, okay, so let me back up a little bit. Um, the particle physicists have what they call the standard model of particle physics, which uh, explains many of the, well, many of the detected particles that have been measured in uh, accelerators, like at CERN or Fermilab, as well as the normal stuff that we're made of, baryons. Um, this, Dark matter is probably something that's not part of the standard model because nothing that's in the standard model really fits the bill so far. So it's very uncertain what it is. Um, it's almost uh, it's it's almost certain to be some kind of subatomic particle. It has to be weakly interacting. We know it has to be relatively massive, so it's not a neutrino. But that particle has never been detected in uh, you know in an experiment on earth, you know, in a particle physics lab, but that's the leading guess for what it is. Thank you. Uh, there was another question, sir. Um, the the question was that um, over it, it seemed from the simulation that initially the dark matter was more active and um, became le how would you say less active over time and and falling into wells as opposed to like orbiting. Um, uh, uh, with with other dark matter, um, is that how you are seeing it? Yes. So the the second simulation I showed with the stuff removed actually goes into the future. Um, so it's very perceptive to notice this, but um, you know it starts off you almost uniform, and then the pattern builds up, uh, and so the halos are forming, and the cosmic voids are being evacuated and getting deeper. And then, you know, as the questioner said, that seems to stop happening. And that is exactly what we predict to occur. And what is really happening is that, which you can't see because the expansion has been taken out, but at a certain point, the expansion starts to accelerate and the acceleration, uh, the accelerated expansion of the universe fights against the tendency of stuff to clump. Um, and essentially things can stop clumping at that point. So that's why the pattern kind of seems to end. Uh, and we actually call it freeze out because it, it freezes. It stays locked in the pattern that it has, but it doesn't get any different from what it was before. Because it, at that point, the universe is expanding much too quickly. And so the pattern is just locked in and can't continue to grow. 
<clears throat> we had uh, another one, sir. I'm sorry, the, uh, you said the picture of the smiley face? Go back to it. Oh, at the end. Um, the question was, ah, that one. Um, yeah, the question was, what is being lensed um, and, and what's acting as the lens? What are the, the, the two bright, bright uh, portions? Um, what por role are they playing? Yes, good question. So this is another example of a cluster of galaxies. Um, so most clusters, like the Perseus one I showed you, uh, like the previous one with a supernova going off, um, they usually have one or two giant elliptical galaxies in them and then a bunch of smaller elliptical galaxies. You can see the other yellow blobs around. What you don't see is that's all sitting in a giant ball of dark matter because you can't see the dark matter. And so it's really mostly the dark matter that's doing this multiple imaging. And these things here that you see this arc and these arcs here, the ones that make up the smiley face, those are distorted background galaxies that have been so warped that instead of looking like a little disc, uh, they've been stretched out into what we call giant arcs. Uh, and it's a little bit like this uh, phenomenon that I showed before um, with the wine glass. It's sort of this phenomenon here. There's one, there's really one candlelight, but under some extreme circumstances, it can get split up into arcs of light. And so that's what's making the smile. It's, it's distant galaxies that are doing that. I go. Yeah, I can click it probably goes faster. Go back to where we were before. Those little animations take a while. So that blue stuff is a background galaxy that's at an even higher redshift, is even farther in the universe, and its light is passing the cluster of galaxies, which is halfway between us and them, and then its light is being distorted by the gravitational lens effect. Some of these arcs are very bright arcs, like the one in Abel 370. I, I believe that amateurs have successfully imaged those, but it, I imagine it's extremely challenging. <clears throat> You probably need some pretty good kit and a very dark sight. Uh, thank you. I think we have uh, one more. Sure. Uh, the question is, is there any dark matter in our solar system? Yes, there is. There is. We're whizzing through it all the time. Um, which you don't feel it because we don't think it interacts. So there is dark matter in the solar system. There's dark matter going through your body right now, uh, but you don't feel it. So particle, there are some uh, experiments on Earth which are trying to catch one of these particles, which is very hard because they interact very rarely. Um, and they uh, count on the fact that we're moving through kind of a bath of dark matter particles and that one of those will hit uh, uh, part of their detector. Uh, the problem is the signals are extremely, if they, if the reactions are extremely rare. And so these kind of experiments are usually done deep down in the mines to try to shield from as much as you can, uh, that's going on in the atmosphere. That's not related to dark matter. The dark matter doesn't care because it's going right through the entire earth. So whether you're in a mine or not, doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, great. Shall we switch to a couple of questions from the online people? Um, are there different theories of dark matter that would give different spatial patterns that you could distinguish with Euclid data? Yes, indeed. Um, uh, it, so, it, it, so two things can change. The dark matter properties themselves. So we don't know 
if it dark matter is a, is a subatomic particle, we don't know um, what its mass is. It's hard to measure it, but there is information about the mass of the dark matter particle. It's very indirect. It turns out that if the dark matter is uh, has a low mass, that makes the universe smoother. We know that the dark matter cannot be in a neutrino, which has a very low mass, because then the universe would be so smooth that it wouldn't agree with the observations that we have. So one of the key goals is to try to measure how lumpy the dark matter is on different scales, essentially. And we can do that by making maps of the dark matter and then analyzing them statistically. So that will tell us uh, about the properties of the dark matter itself. And then, you know, as I briefly outlined, the growth of the dark matter is a, with time depends on how quickly the universe is expanding. And so by measuring, we can also measure dark matter at different times. If we go out to the most distant galaxies, we're seeing dark matter, which is roughly halfway between us and those distant galaxies. So if I compare some maps of the dark matter based on distant galaxies, and then I look at some nearer galaxies, that's looking at dark matter, it's a little bit closer, and we can compare how lumpy those two maps are. And that tells us about how these th this lumpiness changes as the universe is expanding. And that depends <coughs> also on the, the amount of dark matter, the way the universe is expanding. So there's a whole bunch of information in making these, these kind of maps and then carefully analyzing them statistically. Okay, great. And uh, you mentioned that the current, uh, simul according to current simulations, we have uh, dark matter lumps and then filaments that connect them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you worked on them. So the question is, what percentage of the dark matter are in the lumps where the galaxies are versus the ones that are make the filaments? So that's an excellent question. It turns out that most of the matter is actually in the lumps. That's what makes the hard the filaments so hard to detect. Um, they're much weaker features. They're much more subtle than the lumps themselves, which is why we discovered the lumps. We've measured the, the, the halos around galaxies, the lumps first. And, and getting these little tenuous filaments was a much bigger challenge because most of the mass is in the halos, is in the lumps. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions in person, Barbara? Um, the the uh, question was uh, going back to the uh, the the smiley face thing. Um, are the the two eyes there? Are those stars or those the two, galaxies? No, the two eyes yeah. are these big elliptical galaxies. So um, they are giant galaxies compared to the scale of our own Milky Way. Uh, giant elliptical galaxies. Uh, as are the other yellow yellowish blobs, but those are smaller elliptical galaxies. But these would be uh, basically amongst the largest elliptical galaxies you have in the universe. Usually the big clusters uh, have uh, the biggest galaxies in them, and they usually have one or two that live sort of close to the center, typically. So those are those yellow things are galaxies, not stars. That's a, Here's a star you can see from its diffraction spikes, uh, but these guys here are galaxies, and that's the galaxy that's every, almost everything except for this guy is a galaxy in this picture, including the arcs, which are blue spiral background galaxies, which have been greatly distorted. And then the, the question was, uh, where where was this picture? You want to know like what part of the sky? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's a <laughs> Hubble picture. I don't know which cluster it is, to be honest. I forget which one it is. So I, I can't tell you where it is in the sky. Um, I could look it up, but it would take a few seconds. So uh, you might be able to Google it yourself. I don't I don't recognize it I uh, as one of the more famous ones, uh, like Perseus or something like that. So I'm not sure off the top of my head which cluster it actually is. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Let's take some questions from the online audience. Uh, so you did mention that the stuff that scientists have eliminated as being uh, 
dark matter. And now the questioner wants to know, could there be uh, primordial black holes? You, you eliminated black holes, right? Yeah. Could there be primordial black holes that make up part or all of the dark matter? Um, in, in principle, yes. Since we know so little, almost anything's possible. But uh, I will say the reason that they're not favored as a um, uh, as as the likely thing to make up dark matter, there's kind of a theoretical answer, and then there's an observational answer. So the theoretical answer is the universe starts off very very smooth as far as far back as we can see, and we look to the fog of the distant cosmic microwave background. It's almost completely uniform. It has very, very tiny ripples, but the ripples are only like one part in 10 to the five smaller than the kind of average. So the universe is almost completely smooth. So it's not obvious from such smooth beginning that what would make, to make black holes, you have to have some mechanism to compress a bunch of matter together into a very tight ball. And that normally we know that happens when stars explode, some goes out and some goes in, um, but we don't know what would do that in the early universe. So that's kind of the theory answer. And then uh, there's another effect, which is also related to lensing. It goes by the name of micro lensing. So um, even though, uh, you know, if you're looking, let's say at, now this is a type of lensing now of stars rather than of distant galaxies. And if you're looking at a star in our own Milky Way galaxy, it can happen occasionally that another object passes between us and the star. And even if we can't see that object, it can make the background star temporarily appear brighter and then it goes back to normal. So this is a very rare event, which is why you don't see it when you're just out observing. Um, it's extremely rare, but people have studied it systematically and they understand the statistics of how often this should happen. And so you could say, well, if our dark matter, if our Milky Way, which we think is mostly dark matter, if that dark matter were made of black primordial black holes, then, and they were floating around invisible, occasionally they'd line up with a background star and make it bright. Uh, and that's not seen, it is seen from a few stars, but not enough to, not enough to uh, make up the dark matter that makes up most of the Milky Way's halo, I guess is the best way to put it. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, we have another question. Um, how far back in the history of universe has gravitational lensing been detected? Ah, very good question. So, um, you know, very, I'm trying to think what is the most distant gravitationally lensed object, I would guess. I'm trying to remember which one it is. Um, there are some very distant, distant objects. And by distant, I mean they have a redshift of around four, five, and six. So those would be early galaxies seen when the universe was maybe only, you know, 500 million years old, it's a long time, of course, but compared to the age of universe, it's not so long. So something like that, we have seen these very distant galaxies. And in fact, uh, it's one of the ways that um, uh, you can actually look for uh, very, search for very distant galaxies, because if you look at this happy face, for example, um, you know, let's look at this arc over here. I see, I think, three images of the same galaxy. One, I think you can see my pointer, two, and three on that arc. But they're much more magnified than they would be if that lens wasn't there. Um, so one of the goals for James Webb uh, is to um, look behind these clusters of galaxies because then the cluster acts like a second telescope in some sense and magnifies those distant objects. So it's, it's gonna be observing many of these clusters over time uh, to try to look in the special areas where we think that you would see these magnified galaxies. So they have been detected at very high redshifts, but I'm not sure what the record holder is. I would guess around six, but it could be higher. 
Thank you. Uh, Barbara, in-person questions? Uh, the, the question is that the galaxies that are shown as uh, lensed um, appear to be very blue. Mm -hmm. And what does that say about what a wavelength that light may have been starting out before they, they got to the point where they were being lensed or where we can actually see, <clears throat> excuse me, see them? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. These, If they're very distant, what you see is like a blue light may actually be in the rest frame of that galaxy, maybe much more towards the ultraviolet. So they've been redshifted, right? Their light has been redshifted. Um, whether something appears in an image like this, blue or red, you know, just depends on what the ratio of red and blue light is in the observed frame. And so that maps on to something which is a range which is much bluer. And so if that is very hard to describe without <laughs> making a, a, you know, a picture on the uh, on the screen. But, you know, what we see is red and blue, let's say, will map into ultraviolet and more ultraviolet. <laughs> right. And so if something looks blue to us. That means it had more ultraviolet more on the far ultraviolet and less on the new near ultraviolet. But then both of those colors are redshifted to what we perceive as like blue and red, for example. If that, if that explanation helps, <laughs> it's a bit confusing. Redshift doesn't mean that they look red necessarily. I guess that's one of the messages. Okay, thank you. One question uh, from the online audience. So. Um, Let's talk about the uh, distribution of uh, dark uh, dark ma dark matter locally. So we know in universal scale it's clumps and then filaments and then voids. Uh, but what about within a uh, galaxy or in a cluster? Do we consider them to be smooth, or, or is it like dense at the core? And also, are we talking about a halo, like a sphere that covers everything, or their disks, uh, like the galaxies' shapes themselves? Mm, very good. Very good. So the, it, it, if the simulations are accurate, and it depends a little bit on the properties of the dark matter, like I mentioned, so it's not 100% certain because we don't know exactly all the properties of the dark matter. But if the dark matter is quite a massive, turns out to be quite a massive particle, then the, the halos of dark matter are, to a good approximation, fairly smooth. Most, they have the highest density right in the center. So for example, the um, the halo around the Milky Way would still have the most dark matter right in the middle of the Milky Way. Um, and then the density drops off as you go further out, um, but the halo extends way beyond where the disk is. So, you know, the Milky Way, we're at eight kiloparsecs, and then we got, could maybe go out another, let's say another eight to reach the edge of the Milky Way's disk. But the dark matter probably goes out to two or three hundred kiloparsecs, so you know 20, 20 times larger, roughly. Um, so the halos are very big, uh, and then in terms and they're but they're still most of the dark. There's still more dark matter in the middle than on the edge. They kind of trickle off slowly, uh, and then about the shapes to. To a first guess, they're not disc-like. They're roughly round, we think, uh, but they're not perfectly round. Um, so, and we've actually measured this with gravitational lensing. I didn't have a chance to talk about it. We've actually measured the shapes of the dark matter halos. Um, and the best description for them would be um, uh, what we would call, um, a triaxial ellipsoid. Okay, so imagine take um, like take a football and then deflate it a little bit. <laughs> so let some air out, right? 
um, but not all the way so that it's completely flat, just a little bit. So then you've got like, in terms of its shape, there's the long part, the part that you throw, and then there'll be like the sideways part will be like intermediate size, and then the deflated part will be a little bit shorter. So it kind of has that shape, but it doesn't have a hard edge. It kind of has that shape and it just extends out and decreases in density as you go further and further out. So try axial because there's three axes and they all have different sizes basically. Thank but you very much. Close to spherical, just a little bit off. <clears throat> Barbara, in person questions? <laughs> Person questions? I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, up there? Yeah. Mm. So you're talking like in the deep field? Um, okay, the question is, in when you're looking at something like the Hubble Deep Field, um, where there are just, you know, an incredible number of galaxies shown, how many of those are actually lensed? Or uh, so in a typical field like the Hubble Deep Field, there won't be that many lenses, um, because this strong lensing phenomenon is actually quite rare. Uh, for normal galaxies, you need quite a lot of mass to get this effect. Um, so I would guess in Hubble, there might only be one or zero uh, in the Hubble Deep Field, for example. These fields that I've shown you are, you notice I mentioned clusters of galaxies many times. Those clusters of galaxies are big balls of galaxies, but they also have a huge dark matter thing. And so they're more powerful for lensing than just an average bit of sky. Normal galaxies can be strong lenses, but it's relatively rare. So, you know, maybe one in a hundred, one in a thousand, something like that would have that. So maybe in Hubble, there is one hiding and we haven't detected it. I'm not aware of one in the Hubble deep field, but there could be one. Okay, thank you, Barbara. You have another? No, I, I think that we're we're good. It's been really fascinating. Okay, Thank great. So Just much. a few more questions. Uh, we are holding our speaker too long after his, his midnight. Um, so how er, how uh, soon should we uh, see early dark matter maps from Euclid? Ah, good. Well, I'm looking forward to them as well. I'm part of the team, so I will see them before the public will. Um, but we don't expect to see the first release of data, even internally, for about another, uh, roughly another year. And then it'll be about a year after that, that, um, that, that the first round of Euclid data will be released to the, to the whole world. So I would say about two years. Okay, great. Thank you. And can you tell us about the aperture of Euclid and the resolution of the camera in inches per pixel, perhaps? Very good. Um, inches per pixel, I'm not sure about. Um, or pixels uh, per inches. <laughs> uh, the scale of the the scale of the camera. Yeah, I should. I don't actually know what the scale of the camera is in in uh, inches. I'm trying to remember what the what they are. Um, I know that they are about 0.1 arc second, uh, but I forget what the scale of the whole uh, telescope is. But the aperture is about a, a 1.5 meters. Uh, so that means it's a little bit smaller than Hubble, which is 2.4. Uh, for reference, it's much smaller than James Webb, which is closer to four meters. Um, and so the resolution of the imaging is limited by the diffraction. Uh, and so Euclid is close to Hubble, but not quite as sharp as Hubble. Uh, maybe has a, um, you know, a point spread function, full width half max, something like um, 0.18 arc seconds, whereas Hubble is closer to 0.1 because of its bigger, bigger aperture, if that helps. Sure, thank you very much. 
And uh, just one last question. There are a couple of more questions, but I think uh, we don't have uh, any more time left. I apologize to those questioners. Uh, the last question is that the, the simulations you showed that were very uh, interesting. Uh, what kind of software are, are scientists using to make those video uh, simulations? Yeah, the simulations, that's really state-of-the-art work um, to do this kind of, they're called in-body simulations. So they typically have billions or even in some cases up getting up tens of billions, getting up towards a trillion particles in them. And they all interact gravitationally with each other. So this is all what I would call, you know, the state of the art stuff is custom software. It's written by scientists, not something you can buy um, uh, off the shelf. But some of the, so the people who do this stuff keep the best stuff for themselves private until they have a better thing. And then they sometimes release their old ones. So if people want to play with this, I believe there's a public co code out there uh, by one of the experts in the field, and the code is called Gadget 2. Just spelt like a gadget like you would imagine, but the version that he's released is Gadget 2, and he writes his papers based on Gadget 3, you see, <laughs> where he's made some improvements. <laughs> but, uh, but that code, uh, you can, if you know what you're doing, you can download it, run it, and make your own simulations with it. And it might be a bit technical. It's probably not the easiest software to use, but if you're willing to invest the time, uh, you can do it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hodgson, for uh, for this generous expenditure of your time with us and the great presentation. Uh, before I wrap up, Barbara, do you have any final uh, comments to make? Um. Uh, just that it's been a it was a wonderful talk and thank you so much for all of the additional information you gave us during the uh, question session. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, with this said, let me remind everybody that uh, please do check on the website calendar. Uh, we have all our events listed there and I hope to see you all uh, next month with another speaker. Uh, until then, everybody take care and have uh, great times ahead. Bye-bye.